Welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be joined by Jenny Chan today. Jenny is a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. She's the founder of Spectra Wellbeing, where she teaches Qigong for the health and well-being of her students. Now, I was not familiar with this particular form of traditional Chinese medicine before this conversation and before uh, my producer found this, uh, this great expert. But we have been talking on this program about the emerging trend of alternative medicine, and certainly traditional Chinese medicine is one of the first that people turn to. This um, is, I think, an important trend, if only because it's really about wellness, it's really about well-being. And so, as I've said in other episodes where we cover this topic, I want to begin by saying this is not advocating for any particular form of treatment. This is not advocating for alternative medicine against traditional Western medicine. Uh, This is simply giving a perspective and giving you a little more information about a trend that I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about, and I'm already hearing a lot about now and, and going into the future, and that is... How can we use all the tools at our disposal, traditional, uh, science-based, as well as cultural-based, to just make ourselves better, uh, to make ourselves less stressed, more focused, physically healthier, mentally stronger, and especially given the demands, the ever-growing demands on all of us, whether you're heading a family or heading a business, it's important to think about what's going to work for you. So... Uh, Rather than me try to explore this and keep it all to myself, I thought it'd be helpful to bring people onto this show as I'm learning so that we can learn together. And I think Jenny did a wonderful job talking about this particular practice. Uh, She discusses on this program the value of replenishing your chi, and we'll talk about what that is uh, for those who don't know, and how she teaches her students uh, to use the practice of Qigong to improve their mental, their mental and physical health and well-being, and also to think about other aspects of their health, including what they're eating and uh, how they're spending their time during the day, and how living with long-term health conditions that may be treated by traditional medicine can be helped through some of the practices that she and her community uh, advocate for and teach. I also think Jenny just has a fascinating backstory. And uh, as somebody who has started her own business and is managing stress in her own life in a unique way, and somebody who came out of a high-stress corporate environment, she has a lot to share about what she's learned throughout her entire journey. So I very much appreciate Jenny spending time to teach me and hopefully teach all of us a little bit about this topic. Hopefully you get something out of this conversation. So I present to you my conversation with traditional Chinese medicine specialist and the founder of Spectra Wellbeing, Jenny Chan. Jenny, welcome to the program. Thanks, Brian. So you had an interesting journey to becoming a Chinese medicine practitioner and having your own company that supports people in uh, in their well-being. Tell us a little bit about your background in your own words. I gave a little bit of an introduction, but nobody can tell their story quite yeah. like themselves. Thanks, Brian. Um, So I came into traditional Chinese medicine just a few years ago. Um, Like uh, my background is Chinese and I grew up in Australia um, with like as we were growing up, there was always Chinese medicine in the background. Whenever I felt ill, there were always alternative medicines to your like antibiotics that you just take regularly so there would be like some herbal remedy um, that my mother would give me (laughs) instead of taking your um, say western medicine Um, but only until I came into qigong a few years ago and studied that and became a qigong instructor then I understood more about traditional Chinese medicine. Um, Under the guise of traditional Chinese medicine, there's different sides to it. So there's the acupuncture side, there's the herbal side, and also the physical side, which involves Qigong and Tai Chi. And so I've come into the Qigong side and I came into this space because I used to work 
um, in corporate finance as an event manager for over 13 years. Um, so I fully understood what burnout involved <laughs> and I found that into my career I had to like attend a yoga retreat year on year and I found that that was super helpful and along that journey I found that there was something bigger in life <laughs> and so uh, I came across Qigong once and then decided to just do a course in it um, and since then I now teach Qigong regularly and also conduct sound healings probably once a month or twice a month um, and that also involves um, like Tibetan singing bowls um, and a gong so yeah, coming into the energy space, it's quite, yeah, very different from wearing a suit in corporate finance. Um, but I feel that it's more in line with my natural state of being, if that makes sense. It does. So uh, there's a couple of terms in there that we use that I want to make sure that uh, we understand. So um, you mentioned there's herbal, there's acupuncture, there's physical. Uh, I think a lot of people are relatively familiar with the idea of acupuncture. I think people have some sense of the herbal. Talk to us a little bit about physical. So you, you mentioned Qigong. Um, help define that for us. And is it meant to only help physical ailments or is it a physical treatment that is meant to help the whole body? So with Qigong and traditional Chinese medicine, it's, it's like a 360 approach to health. Um, so it's not just taking medicines and then you're fine. Um, ideally, if you're able to do some physical activity, um, adjust your diet to the seasons, then ideally your health should be in a nice balance. Um, and so you should be your illnesses should be less and you should have more energy and vitality, ideally. <laughs> um, but that's all dependent on the type of body disposition that you have. Um, so just going back to Qigong. So Qigong is um, like Tai Chi's older sister. It was created about three, 4,000 years ago and it came from China. So the martial artists that were practicing martial arts, they slowed down their practice and then Qigong came out of this because they found a whole host of medicinal benefits by slowing down their practice. So Qi means vital energy and Gong means to master. And so vital energy not just runs in us human beings like blood and water, it's all around us. Um, and as humans, we have a certain amount of chi that we're born with. And naturally, as we age, that naturally just diminishes. But as a Qigong practitioner, you can work at topping that up because, as I said before, chi is all around us. It's on the earth that we walk on, the air that we breathe. It's in the plants, the trees around us. Um, the sun, the stars, the moon. And if you have a pet at home, they're super cheat out animals. Um, they don't have to worry about very much, do they? <laughs> they just, um, yeah, they're just worried about just a few things. And that's what we try to come into in the space of Qigong. So Gong means to master and so what we're trying to do in the art in the practice of qigong is to remove any heaviness or stagnation that is like come into the body because i like to say that as humans we're we're great at taking on emotional things um we can actually become emotional hoarders um However, in the modern world, we're not really taught how to release that. Um, and with the art of Qigong, it comes into your breath 
and you come into your body and you release that gently and slowly um, through this mindful practice. Um, the practice can be quite repetitive um, and slow, but it tries to get you to slow down your breath. And once you slow down your movements, you slow down your breath, that alters your brainwave patterns and brings you back down into a state that you're more relaxed. It bring, brings down your, it works to bring down your blood pressure as well. Um, lately, I've been having students take their pulse at the start of a class and towards the end of the class. And with a number of students, we found that their heart rate actually, or their pulse, like the number dropped. Um, and that was super interesting in just an hour class. So there's no shortage of potential benefits. How does one get started? What's the, what's the course from going from where you were, which is working Lord knows how many hours and <laughs> yeah. certainly dealing with stress. You mentioned emotional hoarding. Um, where, where does one begin to start this practice? Um, I think the best way to look into it is just to see if they host it in your local gym or in your local yoga studio. Um, it's becoming more popular now. Um, it's still quite, it's not as popular as yoga. Um, however, if you look it up online, you'll be able to practice it in some studios or even online on YouTube. There's certain locations where you can practice the practice there. So let's talk a little bit about some of the topics you mentioned as, as part of it, because it, you said it's a 360 view. So one thing you mentioned there, which I found fascinating, was adjusting your diet to the seasons. I'm sure you can't go into all of the different things that that means for every season of the year, but maybe give us an example. You know, we're coming up here in the Northern Hemisphere on our spring coming off of a winter time, what would it mean to adjust? If I was adjusting my diet for the changing seasons, uh, what does that mean? Okay. So during winter in the Qigong practice, we focused on our kidneys because our kidneys manage our water lines in our bodies. And that also manages, um, so water can like conducts heat in our body as well. So we try to have that run efficiently and smoothly. So then heat, can run smoothly in our body so we're not um, losing too much heat. Once we move into spring, the, the organ that we focus on is our liver. And our liver in traditional Chinese medicine is known as our body's commander. It directs the flow of qi and blood in our body. And so what we want to do is make sure, it's also known as our body's sponge. And so springtime, we give our house a spring clean. And in Qigong, we give our body a spring clean through cleaning out our internal sponge. Um, so it's all about detoxing and cleansing during the springtime. So the color that we focus on is green, not just green surrounding us with spring, but in the foods that we eat as well. So we eat a lot of greens, um, vegetables, what else is good? Like, like kale, very dark green leafy vegetables because this helps to cleanse the liver and detox the body and also cleanse the blood as well. So when our liver is out of balance, the emotion that we can feel is anger. And when it's imbalance, you're very organized and you're grounded and uh, what is it yeah you're organized and you're grounded and you're a good planner and so you're you won't go from zero to 100 like that really quickly which can happen when we get super angry about something right um, but if your liver is in imbalance then you'll approach a sticky situation like grounded and with a calm disposition. And so you'll, you'll think about things a little bit more strategically or with a bit
bit more thought process behind it um, as opposed to just going your way or the highway. Um, and so we're actually in a wood year now. We've just moved into a wood dragon year in 2024. Uh, we've just finished the celebrations of Lunar New Year. And so it's the wood dragon this year. Um, and wood is the element of spring. Um, and so we say this year that the dragon is very creative, it's very it's got a lot of vitality um, and it's a very prosperous year as well. So there's lots of energy behind a dragon, but when it's partnered with wood, um, especially as like they say that dragon, a lot of dragon people are entrepreneurs. And so we say that during this year, you'll have a lot of opportunities come your way. However, partnered with the wood element, you will approach these opportunities with a bit more thought process as opposed to just going into it straight away. So you'll be a bit more grounded, a bit more calm and like plan it out a bit more before you go straight into it. Um, that's also particular because we've just moved from a water year. Last year, the year was a water rabbit. And so we say that during a, a water year, a lot of your thoughts that you've been thinking about and ideas that have been brewing will finally come to the surface. And so, yeah, now's, now's the year to get everything moving and planning, but make sure you do so carefully and with a bit more thought process behind it. Yep. Well, I, you know, we covered our Northern Hemisphere, but we have listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. It's yeah. their summer. It's going to be their autumn soon. So yeah. why don't we cover the other two seasons? What are the organs and foods that we think about in summer and fall? So summertime, it's a very young time of year. So it's um, it's all about the sunshine I um, and it's all about being outside and being social. The element is fire Um and there's actually two seasons in summer. So there's summer and then there's late summer. So summer is fire and late summer is earth. And so late, like summer is all about the heart and just balancing the heart there. Like we know that the heart experiences joy and love. But when it's out of balance, it can experience things like stress, anxiety and depression. And so, so, yeah, you want to make sure that you're doing all the social things, but then also being mindful that you're not overdoing things. Um, and when we come into late summer, which is, yeah, about the time that they're entering now, um, it's all about earth and your digestive system. So during summer, we're eating all the like really lovely foods out there, like the lovely fruits are in season, salads. But now you want to get your digestive system ready and prepared for the heavier foods that are coming that we'll have during autumn and winter. And so it's making sure that your digestive system um, is a bit more efficient and you cleanse that out a bit. So then when we come into autumn, it's cooler. Um, that element is metal. And the, the focus organs that we look to are the lungs. And the lungs govern our immune system. And so during autumn time, you work at strengthening your immune system and building up a shield to protect you from um, all the nasties and like bacteria that's in the air. So you yeah, we work on like opening the chest and the lungs and removing any heaviness or blockages that sit there. And if we do get ill um, with these practices, we want to make sure that the illness is a, short, a shorter period of time and the ailments aren't as severe. Now, you also mentioned that you work in sound. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the importance of sound and how it works with everything you've already talked about with diet and movement? So sound is another really interesting space that I've come into. 
So as a sound practitioner, I work with a gong and Tibetan full moon singing bowls um, and chimes and an ocean drum. And it's all about having people come into a space where they can just relax and not have to think about anything. Um, with the sound bowls, they work at altering people's sound waves, um, like brain, sound waves and brain waves in our body. Um, our bodies are made out of 80% water. And so what these bowls, like the sound and the vibrations, create uh, waves through our body when they're played. And so they work at removing any stagnation or blockages that could be sitting in our body. Um, it's not uncommon for emotional or physical things to come up during a sound healing or even following a sound session um, because yeah they they work at dislodging that um that stuck energy and the bowls they'll create this sense of energy and go to where they need to go in your body um, they're quite intuitive um but yeah it's yeah it's quite interesting how yeah it it brings your brain waves down from say alpha down to that state of beta or delta now, is this a kind of practice, whether it's the, the sound or some of the physical movements of Qigong that you can do multiple times a day? Is it a once a day? How many times a week would you be practicing? Give us a sense of how you practically work this into your daily or weekly schedule. Ideally, with Qigong, um, if you're able to do that daily, that would be ideal. If it's even if it's just for five or ten minutes in the morning, um, that would be great. Like sometimes I just give my learners like a short five, ten minute exercise to do in the morning, just so then they can work on that training and to move their body on a daily basis. Uh, one thing that I learned in training was that if you don't you move your body's muscle on a daily basis you lose that muscle for 30 days. So um, so Qigong, ideally about 20 to 30 minutes, ideally an hour if you can. But if you only have 5, 10 minutes in a day, that's better than nothing. Um, and then with a sound healing session, I would recommend that maybe once a month, but if you'd like to do that a little bit more every two weeks, I'd say, um, because sound healings can be quite powerful and intense on the body and so not to overload it with, with too many sessions. What would you advise someone to do to, in preparation for perhaps their first session? Uh, do they need to get themselves physically ready Otherwise, do they need to stretch? Do they need to, um, you know, eat a certain way in the morning? Like, how, how do you get the most out of these sessions? For a sound healing session? We'll start with those, yes. Yeah, so with a sound healing session, I recommend a light meal prior to the session. Um, ideally, no caffeine and no alcohol before and after a session. So no alcohol about a day following the session and afterwards to drink a lot of water um, because following a sound session there could have been toxins that have like come to the surface and so you need to flush that out of your body and so the most natural way for that to occur is to flush it out with water um, yeah and then for the I mean, maybe talk me through to, uh, you know, what a five or 10 minute Qigong exercise looks like or sounds like. And then, and then what would you do in preparation for that to get the most out of those five or 10 minutes? Yeah. So one of the exercises that I have beginners do is basically to just move their weight onto the balls of their feet. Um, so a lot of the time we stand on our heels in the modern world. 
Um, and when we do that in traditional Chinese medicine, we say that you're disconnected from earth. And so once you bring the weight of your body onto the balls of your feet, you're actually standing on kidney point meridian one. So your kidney, your kidneys are known as your body's batteries in traditional Chinese medicine. And so once you're standing on kidney point one, you're actually drawing in energy from the earth up your kidney meridian lines. Um, so then I would have them stand on their balls of their feet and that's, that's probably the easiest training that one can do. And then if they'd like just to tap their lungs and the back of their hands with their kidneys and just to gently twist their waist and look out the window and have a look at a tree or a plant inside their house and just to tap their lungs and their kidneys, um, especially now in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a, a wee bit chilly when you walk out the door. And so once you're tapping your lungs and your kidneys, what you're doing is you're not just releasing the blockages that sit there, but getting them ready to when you walk out the door. Because when you walk out the front door, it's going to be cold. So your lungs need to be ready to take in that cool air and like move it into like warmer air so it can move around your body and your kidneys because they keep your body warm. You want to make sure that your kidneys are working effectively for you, giving you that energy that you need to walk out that front door in the cold. So um, I'm curious if there's any particular disorders, physical, mental, or otherwise, that you have had either patients or folks that you've been advising who have been particularly helped by this. Uh, as you know, in the Western world, it's pretty common to throw medications at everything um, or to do a variety of tests. And unfortunately, a lot of people never really get back to their, their good health. They maybe, maybe manage their symptoms. So are there any common disorders that you have seen that practicing Qigong or any of what you've mentioned from changing your diet to align to the seasons to, you know, uh, sound sessions, uh, has it been particularly beneficial for any mental or physical disorder that, that many, many people deal with? So a common one as we age is we lose the strength in our legs. Um, and so some of the students that I teach are a wee bit older. Um, after a few sessions, maybe two or three months in my class, some students have said that their legs have actually gotten stronger um, from attending weekly classes. Um, they say that they don't trip as much when they're walking on the pavement um, and they feel stronger in their body. Um, so one of the things about Qigong is, yeah, that connection to earth and like strengthening your legs, like whether you're 15, 30, 60 or 70, this works on bringing that qi back into your body. Another one of my learners they advise that their breathing capacity um, expanded so um, they were able to breathe better um, they did a test with their doctors and they said that yeah their breathing had improved immensely um, because yeah just from coming to class <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think what else? Yeah, earlier with the lower blood pressure, um, taking the pulse at the start and at the end of class, um, there was just an immediate, yeah, immediate um, decrease in their pulse after a one-hour class. And what else? Yeah, a lot of learners have also said that they don't feel as stressed or anxious because they come back into their breath 
um, in the modern world, we're very used to just breathing down into our chest here. And that's like our flight or fight response. Um, because we're always like spending a lot of energy and time up in our heads. Um, and so what this practice works at doing is bringing the breath down into your lower abdomen and bringing like the breath and the chi and energy down into your lower abdomen and all the organs that sit down there, like things like our stomach, our liver, our reproductive system, our kidneys are down there and our, our intestines as well. So it's all about releasing all that tension that we hold down there um, by bringing that chi and that breath down into your lower belly. Like it's something that we did naturally as babies when we came out of our mother's wombs. But unfortunately, like as we aged and especially in the workplace, we're just breathing down into our chests and um, we actually, many of us just think that that that's normal but unfortunately <laughs> it's yeah um if we're able to bring our breath down into our lower abdomen and um, it'd be so much better for your bodies and yeah you'll be able to like stand more upright and but unfortunately we spend a lot of our time with our shoulders hunched because we're looking at our phones or over our laptops so these ancient practices trying to get you to come back into your body um, through your breath and everyone has this um, yeah every everybody has this so it's just about yeah discovering this practice so then you're able to just ease that tension and stress out of your body and yeah it doesn't take a lot it's it's really quite interesting like just even with my own body I feel so much more healthier and fitter than I did say six years ago I look at old photos of myself like six seven years ago and it's totally different to, to now like there was a lot more stress on my face um yeah so let's talk a little bit about um those who are in a high stress environment so I think one of the conversations happening around the world today, and especially for anybody who's in a high stress job, and that may not even be a corporate job, it may be people who are in law enforcement or people who are in the medical field, um, that the jobs themselves come with inherent stress, uh, that it's, it's never going to be a stress free environment. So you have to do the best you can to manage that. So for somebody who is in a higher stress, that, that, that's their natural, unfortunately, that's their profession or that's the place they are in their life. How would you adjust your recommendations for those people versus somebody who might be in a lighter stress career and they're, they're dealing with more of the issues of aging or maybe they're dealing with issues of, uh, you know, maybe a disorder like cancer or something, right, which has stress in a different way. How would you focus your or how would you advise someone to focus their energy and their practices if their natural 40 hours a week or more is in a pretty high stress environment? I would recommend that they do things that they enjoy, something outdoors with their family, even if it's just for five, 10 minutes a day. Um, and just to, or even if it's just for 30 seconds, just work at 30 seconds first and then the following day grow it to a minute, then the following grow it to like 90 seconds and just gradually build up that time where you can at least give yourself half an hour to do something that you enjoy in the company of others. Um, it's hard because when you have that to-do to -do list sitting in front of you, and there's a short time frame. Um, yeah, if, if things are sitting in your mind, just put that to-do list down and get it out of your brain, put it on paper and then prioritise it and then try and put in some well-being in there as well, even if it's just five minutes of or one minute of breathing at your desk um, and just slowly try to make it a habit. It takes 21 days to change a habit in your life. Um, so, 
so yeah, it's it sounds. I don't know. It sounds quite easy, but it's like when, once you've been there, it's it's difficult because there's a lot of stress that sits around in your body when you're at that point in life. However, you just need to you need to start making changes. Otherwise, your body will tell you that you need to make changes in a different way that you won't enjoy <laughs> and. With traditional Chinese medicine, prevention is better than cure. Um, and that's probably in a lot of like other cultures as well. Um, but yeah, prevention is definitely better than cure <laughs> because yeah, we don't want to be there in the cure stage. How do you look at traditional Chinese medicine and what we'll call now modern Western medicine. Uh, do you view these in conflict or can they be complementary to each other? I think they can absolutely be complementary. Um, if you've been diagnosed with some antibiotics that you need to take um, and you take on the practice of, say, Qigong on a weekly basis, I definitely don't recommend saying, oh, yeah, stop taking the medicines. Like, keep taking what's prescribed and keep working at the well-being practice or the physical activity that you're doing and then visit the doctor a few months later and take a test and see if there's a change that has occurred in your body. Um, and then if the level of antibiotics can be changed or altered or minimised, um, your doctor will be able to tell you that. But I definitely think they can be complementary um, because it's all at working to make your body better. Uh, I'm also curious, I've never asked anybody who's a practitioner of Chinese medicine. I've heard the concept of qi. I think some in our audience may have. Now they certainly have the definition today. Mm. Is there such a thing as good and bad energy, or is all energy positive? I like to explain it as qi and excess qi. Um, at the end of a Qigong session, I like to say, I do a closing where we work on removing excess qi that we don't need out and bringing in the good qi. Um, and it's all about that intention as well, because your energy flows where your intention goes. Um, and sometimes too much qi of one thing, like too much happiness can be may not be good on your body. So you work at balancing. It's all about that balance and the yin and the yang. So, yeah, there there's excess and there is good chi. Um, so it's all about just smoothing out those chi lines and, yeah, finding that balance, that yin and that yang. And then in terms of practitioners, so I'm curious how, what is the process to becoming uh, a practitioner of qigong? So I took a course uh, for about a month uh, with my instructor um, and, yeah, yeah, it was a 200-hour um, Qigong instructor course. Um, however, during the session, it felt a lot more <laughs> than 200 hours. There was a lot of learning that that we did during the course. Um, but, yeah, there are Qigong practitioner courses out there or Qigong instructor courses out there. But if you're interested, I would recommend that people try Qigong first. Um, try it either, like, at your local yoga studio or try it online. Um, see how it feels in your body and see if that's the right practice for you. Um, and, yeah. But yeah, since becoming a Qigong instructor, it's totally changed my life. <laughs> How so? How so? Um, I feel that now that the Qigong practice is definitely what I should be doing in life. Um, I felt that everything that I was doing before was in preparation for what I'm doing now. Um, it feels a lot more rewarding helping people like with their health and well-being, um, especially like working out with communities as well. Um, 
and yeah I'm constantly learning in this practice like week in week out I'm always learning something new um and I used to yeah I had a monkey mind so I used to always like be stressed or always be thinking about something or always super impatient about things but now I find that I'm a lot more calmer <laughs> a lot more chilled um when I approach situations and yeah I feel much better in my body as well since coming into this practice and so we we want to talk a little bit about your practice, um, Spectra Wellbeing, right? Is the yes. name of your organization. Correct. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you came to create it, right? You, you're a practitioner. You could have easily gone to work for somebody else, mm -hmm. or or not made a business out of it. This could have been a side thing for you. You you chose to make this your your profession, your career. Talk to us about the process of getting that stood up did you know that you wanted to make it a business or did this sort of come together because of the number of people interested in the topic i started this business in london and speaking to many people in london everybody knew about the practice of tai chi but not really qigong and i guess in many ways i'm quite stubborn <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is just what I'm going to do. And it's like, Muhammad said, if you build it, people will come, right? <laughs> um, but don't get me wrong. When I first came into this space, I was sitting on the fence for a very long time. Like, should I go back into corporate events? Should I go back into corporate events? That was running around in my mind for a really, really long time. But I actually had a conversation with my mother and she was like, you need to give it 100%. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. And with those words, it's like, okay, <laughs> I've just got to do it. Um, and so I just put the fear aside and just went for it. Um, don't get me wrong. I like started this just before the pandemic and things were super, super slow. But I also found that during this time, I was able to build up that confidence and like try to release that fear of going back to what I knew um, as an entrepreneur. Like it's a really lonely like like expedition that we go along. Um, but I was just like, no, nope, I'm just I just have to do this. I just have to do this. Um, and I found that along the journey, like slowly but surely. You just have to put it out there to the universe. It sounds like woo-woo. It sounds really crazy. But once you relinquish and let go of those fears and just plan and just go for it, um, then slowly but surely the business, like, built up. Um, now I'm finding that I'm teaching a lot more and holding more sound healing sessions. Um yeah, now it feels like I'm in the right space in the right time. Like I'm really feeling the dragon energy <laughs> this year. Um, but it did take a little bit of time to build up the business. Um, but I also felt that this time was needed to not only build up that confidence, but when conducting a sound healing session and Qigong class, I need to be able to hold that space for the attendees to release all that emotional things that they that they bring into a class or a session so um yeah I feel really fortunate and grateful that this is what I do um it just feels natural but I feel that I have a lot of support behind me um yeah I feel really lucky <laughs> that I get to do this as a as a living as any great entrepreneur usually says, they feel <laughs> they, they, what does Warren Buffett say? Tap dance to work. Uh, I think <laughs> yes. that's basically where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so one last question about your business. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I think part of the reason we're talking about this today on this program is there's been an increasing trend of people looking for alternatives to Western medicine. And so certainly Chinese medicine has been one of those. Uh, I'm curious what you're seeing in your client base. Uh, are you seeing younger people, older people, or, or certain cultures more uh, open to it? Uh, are you seeing more uh, people interested? Just getting a, a general 
uh, view of what you're seeing in your business and the trends of who's who you're meeting with and and how many people are coming to your your courses and your classes? Yeah, it's a wide array of people. Um, a lot of my learners are older in Qigong, um, but then I'm also finding that there's many learners in their 20s and 30s that come to class Um, and so the older learners they have that patience to go through the slow movements um, and they really enjoy the sessions because it's helping to improve their health but with the the people in their 20s they are finding that it's super helpful because of the stresses that they that they encounter either at work or in just in general life at the moment. So it's it's a really yeah, it's it's a mixed bag of attendees in the classes. Yeah. But are you hearing more interest from even people in your personal circle? Do you feel like you're getting you're finally getting through uh, and people understand the distinction between as you mentioned yoga is pretty well understood, tai mm-hmm. chi is pretty well understood. Do you feel like there's a more public awareness and consciousness of Qigong? Qigong, I think it's it's slowly coming out of the woodworks now. Um, there's, like, as I look on TikTok and Instagram, there's more and more people doing shorts on there. Um, so, so slowly but surely, like, Qigong is, is coming out now, but I just hope that what I teach is, like, yeah, beneficial for others as opposed to just being there as a practice, if that makes sense. It does. Mm. Um, let's take a few moments here to talk about Spectre Wellbeing. If people want to learn more about it and you, mm-hmm. uh, where can they do so? So I have a website, so spectrawellbe.com. And I've got an Instagram page at spectrawellbe. Um, so yeah, those two spaces where you're able to find me. And we will put those links in the description of this podcast. Jenny, thank you so much for taking time to talk us through this. We'll probably, if you're okay with it, we'd have, we'd love to have you back at some point uh, after our listeners have absorbed some of this. (laughs) Uh, And, and I have a suspicion that there'll be more and more people out there who are learning about this in the months and years to come. So if so, and this become, maybe you're at the vanguard, maybe you are the forefront of this emerging uh, uh, adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, And we'd love to have you back to talk in more detail about some of the more advanced practices. Great. No, I'd love to come back. Thanks, Brian. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully you found that not only interesting and valuable to get a better understanding of this particular form of alternative medicine, but all of the different ways that there may be out there to help manage stress. I don't know if you picked up on it. I certainly did in re-listening to this interview that Jenny is, by her nature, a calming person and has an incredibly calming voice. Uh, I almost feel like I would go back and listen to that interview if I was just having a really long, stressful day, for whatever reason, and just listen to her speak for five or ten minutes, and I think my entire temperature would go down about ten degrees just from the calm that she exudes in her voice. And um, I encourage you to, to listen to this show and share it with anybody who questions, you know, what is the value potential of alternative medicines? I don't fully understand it. I don't understand the science behind it. Well, look, I don't understand the science behind a lot of these things either, but I understand what I feel when I speak to somebody who is seemingly at peace with themselves and at peace in their life. And when you understand this is a person that you just listened to that's running a business, that has come out of a high-stress corporate environment. Does that sound like somebody who is dealing with a lot of stress? You know, we've had guests on this program who are amazing at what they do. They love what they do, but you can tell in their voice. They they talk pretty quickly. They're kind of racing through their thoughts. They're maybe not 100% in touch with how they're feeling on that day. They're a little bit distracted. Jenny was none of those things. So if you're wondering... Is there anything to what we're talking about here? You know, what kind of 
benefits can it have for me? Just listen. Just listen with your ears. Listen to the tone and tenor of Jenny and even my tone and tenor in response to her. You, you hear me talking now. Uh, you hear me on all the other episodes, the 30-plus episodes we've done. Listen to me in talking to Jenny and listen to me talking to anybody else, and you can tell the difference. So there's something to it. And if you can bring your stress level down and increase your inner peace in the way that Jenny does and that she can articulate and you can hear, um, that's a pretty great place to be. So uh, I think you're going to hear more about this topic. Look, we've done a couple of episodes on this. We did at the end of last season. We're going to do a couple this season. I'm not advocating for any specific form of medication or medicine or treatments or anything. I'm simply saying that we should open our minds to all the ways that could work for us. The one thing that traditional practitioners of of medicine, whether they're native cultures or whether they're West uh, Eastern cultures or uh, modern, you know, fact-based, rigorous, scientific method-based, you know, pharmaceuticals and, you know, rigorous licensed approved psychology and psychiatry and so forth. Um, the one thing they all agree on is that medicine needs to be customized to the individual, that there are very few one size fits all approaches that while there are some trends, some things that do work for many, most need to be customized to the individual. And so with that and with the spirit of that in mind, I recognize that what we talked about in this episode may not work for everybody, may not work for you, but it may work for someone you know. And maybe there's elements of what you heard today, and if you worked with Jenny or others, that that would help. Maybe it doesn't solve all of your challenges. Maybe you end up not being able to practice the way that you'd want to. But if it helps even on the margins, I think that would be a very positive development. I think it'd be a very positive thing. And so I encourage you to consider it, share with others, have a conversation, think about it for yourself, but open your mind to the potential that there are many forms of treatment for all of our challenges, including those that are non-clinical. Stress is a natural part of life, but how we deal with it, you know, that's going to be important to determine our overall success and our overall happiness. So we're going to have more topics like this in the weeks to come and episodes to come. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Uh, If you'd like to learn more about Jenny, just go to my website, brianjmatos.com. Find this show, and we have links in the description of this podcast. If you're accessing this show through um, our Apple Podcasts feed, our Spotify feed, our iHeartRadio, you can click right there, get to the Spectra Wellbeing website, learn more about Jenny, find her social media channels. But if you're not accessing it there, maybe somebody's just sent you the downloaded show, brianjmatos.com is the place to go. Just search for Jenny Chan on that site, and you can either find the episode or you can find our show notes. Either way, you'll get more information on Jenny and her program. Thank you all again for listening to this program. Look forward to talking to you again in the next episode. And I hope you will all stay curious.